So, good evening, Eftov. So recently I read in the New York Times an article by Ellen Blinder making this neat observation. On the morning after Mr. Volker's hearing, the New York Times ran a page one article reporting on what was said. Eight years later, the article in the New York Times on Mr. Greenspan's confirmation hearing appeared on the first business page. Not on the first page, but on the first business page. And on Wednesday, some time ago, the account of Mr. Bernanke's hearing was on page four of the business section. There is a very important reason that Mr. Bernanke's, Ben Shalom Bernanke, nomination and confirmation have received so little press attention. The happy truth is that monetary policy is not very controversial and is certainly not very political these days. So it is a good occasion for us in the academia to engage, obviously not in political discussion, we don't need to do that on central banking anymore, but rather in a professional uh, discussion. And the main theme of uh, our panel discussion would be how should the central bank design and implement policies in response to financial or liquidity or, or, or other crisis in the financial sector? Should they incorporate into the rules of conduct the possibility of credit booms that get out of control, asset price bu uh, bubbles in the stock market or in the housing market, you name it. And we have an uh, excellent team I should say, all MIT team, which is fitting, because Alex, as, as I just mentioned uh, an hour ago, was a, a good student coming out of MIT. So on the team we have Jose de Gregorio, the Vice President of the Central Bank of Chile. We thought that it is opt also to put Alex on the team, and uh, the third, the last but not least, uh, panelist is uh, Stan Fisher, the governor of the Bank of Israel. Now just a few remarks about names. In Chile, the head of the central bank is called president, and Jose is the vice president of the central bank. In uh, I think in America it's called chairman. And in Israel it's called governor, possibly because there is no board of governors. But I'm sure that uh, Stan will uh, correct this uh, little mistake. <laughs> so in any case, uh, the rules would be that uh, each of the panelists will speak for 10 minutes, 20 minutes in the first round. Then there will be some feedback from, uh, uh, from, from the audience, and then there will be 10 minutes uh, round up by, by each of the panelists so they can also refer to each other point. And we'll start with Jose de Gregorio, then we'll go to Alex uh, Kuckerman, and then uh, Stan in the first round. So let's start. Somewhere. 
this somebody that I think I will point somewhere. Okay. Yes, sure. Okay, let's, let's, let's look. We know how to look, right? Oh, no, no, not so much. Let me see. Do we have a little time out? Should be here, same way. You see? I don't see it. I don't see it. See, here it is. Okay, so we can go. Okay. Yeah, this thank you very much. So good. I'm very well at Okay. Uh, good afternoon, and, and I'm very grateful for the invitation to come to this very important occasion to honor Alex Kukerman. Um, I, I just remember I, I met him I, by 1990 when I left MIT after studying with Stan Olivier Blanchard and mainly with my advisor, Rudy Dombuch. I thought that there was no life after I, MIT and I went to the IMF, that's just changing letters. And, and, but then I, I, there I met a great economist, and, and, and Alex, Mike Bruno, Asab Racine. And I always say, well, I should have go and visit them. Fortunately, Mike is not here, but uh, finally I visit him. I visit them, and, and in a great occasion. Alex, I, I was not only a great economist, was very good with, the, with people that were just graduating. I, I, I don't know if you told me this, but I always say this is the Kuckerman uh, recommendation with how to handle referees. Because we were just coming out from graduate school trying to publish, and he said, I remember something like that. I, I haven't checked it with you if it is a true statement, but you told me, as long as it's not a matter of principles, you follow what the referee said. And I always tell when students ask me, I tell them, well, go with the Kuckerman. Uh, recommendation and actually it has worked well because I have received a lot of rejections at the first round but at the second round never because I, I go and I and I very obedient with the referee so by the way the so. only person that never received any rejection is Bob Solo <laughs> well was my professor too <laughs> so I'm embarrassed because I have named so many good professors that I would try to do it to, to not to disappoint them so what I will talk with, and, and as, as I've said, well, a bit, we have been talking a lot about the inflation target, and we are all obsessed with the transparency and, and, and monetary policy rules and, 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 and how to implement inflation target. But financial, the behavior of financial markets are important. They're important in part because most central banks, and I will mention later, most central banks have among the mandates to financial stability many central banks I will so what I will talk I will talk some stylized facts that after re checking the presentation is some stylized fact and some of my beliefs uh, so it's a, that's what is this is an elegant way to put it then I'll talk about monetary policy and inflation target and the financial system and, and I will present some some evidence uh, and and then I will go more to the topic of crisis and how this could at some point generate tensions with an inflation objective the objective of financial stability. And finally, since I came so long, I will come and, and tell you that Latin America is not doing as bad as usually. So we'll close with that. <laughs> so let me just this, this belief and style. So what is important? The cost of financial crisis, there are a lot of, of measurements. I, in, in a paper with John Wally, we got a 16% the loss of GDP from a financial and a currency, a banking and a currency crisis. Hutchinson and Noy has a recently, for a duration, average duration of three years, losses of about 10%. In our case, we measure it in five years. So they are large, eight years, 8% of GDP in three years. So, so they, they are relatively important in terms of, and, and some recent, Boyd and, and, co and colleagues, they, they got much larger numbers because they said that they have permanent costs. So you just take all the future stream that you lost. But the point is that, basically the point is that we care a lot about uh, price stability because inflation has welfare costs. But financial crisis could be extremely costly. And this is the average. In, in Latin America, we're used to, to crisis much more costly. So, and, and in general, in emerging markets. So it's, it's, it's important to deal with, the, with financial crisis. Now, what are the determinants of financial crisis? And this is more my beliefs, but, but I think that I'm, I'm, it's poor policies and weak financial regulation. I don't believe that much in, 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 in bad luck. I think that bad luck 
helps to make things bad. But but if you have you have to have some poor policies and weak financial system. I do not know of a country that have had a crisis, a significant crisis, without having any problem. So 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 what we are used and, and in Chile and many other countries, misalignments, current account reversals, they trigger and then they trigger contagion, sudden stop and all the financial market turmoil that, that make things worse and, and very and very uh, costly. But but I think that this is how they, 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 they increase the cost rather than the pure uh, determinants. I, I don't want to, to spend too much time on this, but I think that the, at, the, at the core of, of the crisis, there are poor policies and, and, and weak financial system. Now, what is monetary policy conducted? And there are two pillars, I would say. And this is the, I, I was just checking out of 30 central banks, but this includes central banks from, from Europe, so that now are at the ECB. And, most uh, 10 central banks have the objective of, of financial stability, or in the case of other countries, like in Chile, they call the normal functioning of domestic payments, which is some form of financial stability. Now, if we extend to central banks that have a dual mandate with employment or output that is related to crisis too, we get to, most, uh, to roughly half of the countries of this sample of 30 countries. Now, of these other 15 countries, there are several countries from Europe that now are there at the ECB. So, so, so I would say the majority of countries have some form of financial stability in their mandate. So we need two sort of policies, the strong macro policy, monetary policy conducted by a credibly independent central bank. That's what we have learned, have learned from, from Alex and, and has been implemented in many countries. And also base rule fiscal policy, which in some cases I think that helps a lot and this is the experience that we have in Chile. So that this is helped to reduce the cost of, of achieving low inflation. But at the same time we need the sound financial regulation. Now, what's the problem we have is sound financial regulation, and I think that this is, this is the, the tension that we have with macro, with the stabilization policy, is that lending tends to be procyclical, and I will show some evidence. So instead of stabilizing during the, the, the business cycle, could, could uh, 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 increase uh, uh, the fluctuations. Now, should financial, the banking system in charge of doing the, 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 doing the, the stabilization policies, I think that no. And it would be a mistake to think that the, it has to be aggressive lending during a recession when risks are higher and one would expect that there are more provisions. So, and, and, and now I'll, I'll show, what I will show next is that it doesn't seem that this is a big problem, although there is a, a, a very a, a heated discussion with the procyclicality of the new rules of Basel II. And, and, and this is where I, I start thinking more about these issues. So let me just show about the, the success, and this is uh, figures that I have been looking recently, the success of, 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 of inflation. And there are many reasons for this, but if we compare the impact on 24 months on inflation of the oil price shocks in 24 months, it has decreased. It's almost 10% now of the increase in oil price in 24 months, so this is not just a, a short period, and 24 months has passed to prices in the last two uh, uh, oil price hikes compared to 35% in the last 90s for, for, for emerging markets and more than 20% for developed countries. So there has been, and in terms of inflation, there has been a great success. This may be called the, the changing uh, 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 the changing dynamics of inflation. There are, of course, policies. In the case of oil, there are issues about con consumption and intensity of use of oil. But I think that there has been a lot of, of progress in the inflation front. And I will show that this happened also in Latin America. Now, what I have here is, is the procyclicality of most of countries. In the, in the horizontal axis, I have the correlation between credit and GDP, real credit. Uh, 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 with respect to GDP, and we have most of countries procyclical. They are procyclical, and I have in the in the vertical axis uh, GDP growth. So to see if there is some correlation between growth and having a procyclical system. Indeed, the case of Chile has a large uh, is has sort of 0.6 is the correlation. The case of Israel, I think that's 0.5 or close to 0.5 is up above the line. So this is the correlation between. This is the correlation between credit to the private sector and GDP in the, from 1990 to 
2004. I have done it for longer periods, and but I, I like to see this data. It seems that there is no correlation. Just just by looking at this number, there is no correlation, or strong nothing uh, with uh, with growth. Now let's see. I have that. I have done it with let's see with banking strength. With banking strength, this is an index that the low numbers is a strong banking system. This is a, a, a Moody's evaluation of banking system around the world for, for recent years uh, that is published by the IMF. And we see, we could say that stronger banking systems, is, but, but I think that there are two groups of countries, but stronger banking systems would tend even to be more procyclical. And, and we see here all, most of developed countries, but nothing too, too, too strong. Uh, again, it is not a sign of weakness to have a procyclical lending. Uh, it is it's this kind of, of, of natural. Uh, and I have done it with inflation. I, I just select this to show you because I, 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 I brought many more. Uh, but these are, are, I think, that the most relevant. And this is perhaps the most curious. I'm now, I'm, I'm not. Countries that have deeper financial system because this is private credit over GDP. Countries like Switzerland and Hong Kong, UK, Japan, countries that have very deep banking system, they tend to have more procyclical, uh, 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 more procyclical uh, lending. So in that case, the banking system would be amplifying the business cycle, thinking that the lending, the, the credit channel could kick off. Uh, and so, so this, I, I would say, is the, is the, is the evidence. Now, now as, I, as I say, I, I, just by looking at this and, and, and the role of the central bank and, and preventing financial crisis, and I think that is it, and, and with the new rules of capital where they are more or less procyclical, I think that the first objective should be the strength of the banking system rather than the contribution of the banking system to the business cycle. For that, I think this monetary and fiscal policy. So this is the, the point that I, I, I wanted to make here. Now, regarding the, the other point, which I think that here is when we may have conflicts, and I will mention two examples, is risk management, and, and, and I call it this, this is the way I thought that perhaps it, all this new, uh, uh, this term uh, uh, coined by, by Greenspan about risk management, we can, we can make some sense of risk management, which is crisis, avoiding crisis. With the, the, the objective of the central bank, having price and financial stability, we can separate this. Is the implementation is different. Price stability has to be with an inflation target. To say, let's say we want 75% of the time inflation to be between 1% and 3% forever. So that's price stability. That's a way of so we can say, well, we have plus minus two, or we have a band, or we have, but, there, but we give a number. We give a number where it, around inflation we want to move. The difference is that financial stability is to have a financial system that works, but basically it's that has no crisis. So it's a, it's a more dual objective. It's to avoid crisis in the financial system. Now, crisis is also a little bit continuous. It could be a huge crisis. But we don't want interruptions in the system of payments in the financial system, in the financial sector. So, so and, and, and this is a, the, the new fashion in, in central banking, inflation target and financial stability, is to write the inflation report and the financial stability report. The inflation report has all the fan charts, and we have been talking all day about that. You know, it has fan chart and instead the forecast and the, the potential trajectory of, of interest rate and a lot of transparency and, and the risk. And, well, we know and we have discussed a lot of that. And the financial stability report, basically, what does it try to convey is, is to say, well, how strong are we if there is a tsunami? So that's so we do a stress testing and we say, well, if we if we take the worst case scenario, what's happened to the banking system, what's happened to the financial position of household, of corporations, of the public sector, and that's what we do. So it's kind of different. Now, my, my point is that there could be situations in which there could be some policy tensions. And and I will take as an example to mention these two examples which I, I think that are very relevant and will become relevant, is policy especially in emerging markets which are very prone to, to, to financial crisis, policy tensions when inflation is rising. When inflation is rising, what we have been doing in many emerging countries, when inflation, 
It's not inflation. It's inflation is converging to our target from below. What we're doing is to increase interest rate. So we have a path of gradual increasing interest rate. But what's happened if, for example, this country has a, the increasing interest rate goes together with a exchange rate that is appreciating, and at the same time, the current account is widened. So we have a problem. We have a problem. We used to have problems in Latin America. It showcases what there is not. It seems a problem. But what's happening is that that's a, a, the, 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 what follows is a current account reversal. Many times follow with a sudden stop, with a financial crisis, and with a huge depreciation of the currency. We have tons of examples. So what we would say from an inflation target point of view, if inflation is, raised, is rising, we will increase interest rate. We will put pressure on the exchange rate. There will be an appreciation of our currency. Even, even the current account deficit could widen. We do not know whether, whether the, the, the net effect of, of interest rate will have on the current account deficit and will depend on many things. But, but it's not obvious because there is a, the, the expenditure contraction, but at the same time, the exchange rate appreciation. So this is, this is a, I think that it's a problem that we still do not have. And I, as I show you, still we do not, we have the appreciation. We still, in emerging markets and Latin America, still we do not have the large current account deficit, as is happening, for example, in the case of New Zealand that I will show you. So this is one example that I think that's important and we need to think more about that and, 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 and how we do in the context of an, an inflation target. And, and then there, there, is, there is a financial crisis, the bursting of a bubble or some liquidity problem in the market that when you are raising interest rate, you have to, there is a need of liquidity. You know, the bursting of a bubble at the stock market. And, 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 and so, so there is a trade-off between tightening and loosening. And, and I think that this is, this is also uh, very important. This is the, the Australia, which is a very good example for, for especially coming from a small country, not as rich, but, but commodity based. And what they have had is that they have a persistent, very large current account deficit, more than three, four, and currently close to 6% of GDP, with a, this, the decline, this, and the real exchange rate is appreciating, the decline is appreciating. So, and, and the chain rate has been appreciating since the year 2001, uh, uh, very sharply. So this is, this is the case of Australia. Now, they have a policy, a monetary policy, very expansionary or relatively expansionary at this time, contrary to the case of New Zealand that has been raising interest rate. And interest rate in New Zealand are currently are about 7.5. They have a current account deficit about 8% of GDP uh, and a currency that is sharply appreciating and they have been increasing interest rate. Now, I don't think they can, they, they don't suffer this original sin, they can borrow in their own currency, they have no problems of financing, it's very unlikely that they will suffer a sudden so. If you see a country, even like Chile, like Rudy used to say, decent Chile, or even other countries in Latin America, emerging countries, this is, this is the, the best forecast that they, they will have, they're very close to a currency crisis at least. So, so the, the issue is what to do in, in, this ca in, in these cases. Um, and and one, one point, this is always, one can say, okay, if, well, fiscal, a fiscal surplus in, in, in New Zealand is 4% of GDP. So, so it's the scope for more, the, you can always do more, but, but more on top of four is, is kind of a lot. This is a case of Chile where we start appreciating, but, but in our case, uh, the appreciation has not been that sharp, and we still have a current account surplus. So the question, because we have a very good terms of trade, the issue is what will happen when terms of trade deteriorate and if we keep the appreciation, and I think that this is an important issue. So but my, my concluding here is that basically there are special circumstances in which the inflation target is an incomplete policy framework to analyze the policy response. It's, it's, we cannot go. So in this case, I think that two things that just uh, before, the things are always, we always are very transparent. So I put all my, my presentations in the web of the central bank. So I would say more things, but, but I don't want to write them always because it's. Right. <laughs> so, but the risk management, and this is, and this is escape clauses to, to inflation target. For example, if there is a crisis, you say, well, in the case of Chile, we have a, an objective of achieving 3% forecast in a two-year horizon. You can say, well, given this crisis, we'll 
extend the horizon to three years or to four years. Who knows? It's, it's not trivial, the loss of credibility, what's happened, but, but I think that that's, uh, and, and this, is, this is one of the ways that we could deal with this. But this could also imply that you leave your flexible exchange rate regime or that you start intervening in the, in the, in the financial market. So what I'm saying, basically, that there are contexts in which the inflation, as we know, as we define very narrowly, the, the inflation target is not there. Enough. Just to close, macroeconomic performance, and this is what I told you. Uh, Latin America has been doing, despite all the problems, it has, the 90s, I always say, the 90s were a period in which there was a lot of optimism. But Latin America is doing much better now than during the 90s. You always can say, well, Argentina is a rebound, Venezuela, there's always excuses. But there were also excuses during the 90s. The world is growing very strong, but Latin America is growing very strong during this century compared to what was during the 90s. Most of the countries, uh, most of the countries has been growing very fast. Inflation in just a couple of countries, in Argentina and Venezuela, that I, I, I leave Venezuela here for political reasons, because I cannot exclude that important country, but it's very weird. So, so and, and, and they have uh, the oil shock, and they, have, uh, they are lending money to the Caribbean, and this is a very strange country. So I just leave it because it has to be after the U comes the V. So, is there. But most of the countries, except for Argentina, have one digit inflation, which is very, very unusual. Argentina has our own problems. Current account, current account, after average uh, 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 deficit, we have a, a, an average surplus. So the region, I would say, is on average broad, is, is relatively good. Where there has been more progress is on fiscal. Here, the dotted, the, the, the dotted line. Is the overall is the overall balance and the the, the the continuous line are the primary balance. The the one with the dots is the average for Latin America that went from four the the the, the overall balance from four to, to two percent deficit and an and increasing primary balance from almost zero to four. So now, so just to conclude, I don't want to go on a country by country basis, but there has been a lot of improvements. Just to close, I think that. The region in general is, is, is in a good shape. There has been a lot of structural problems. I think that one of the most dramatic problems in, in latest years is that many of the reforms that were a backlash or, or a retardation in, in pursuing reforms. There are a lot of, but at least from a macro point of view, the, the, the region has made some progress. And, and I think that this is the basis to avoid crisis and to consolidate some progress for the future. Thanks. So, <clears throat> before we move on, uh, I just saw uh, former policymakers and current policymakers in the audience, so I'd like to recognize them. So, David Klein, the former governor of the Bank of Israel, who is uh, really the most important person in uh, liberalizing our capital markets over the last 20 years, and uh, former heads of the research department of the Bank of Israel, David Kochav, and first first the first head of research department, and then uh, Leo Meridor, right? I have to take my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and the current head of the research department, Karnit Fluk whose father used to be the main economist associated with the Vadat Aksafim, and I remember him from there. So the next uh, speaker is Alex. 20 minutes, please. Can you hear me? Michael, is OK? Uh, well, before I, uh, uh, well, first of all, I, sh I should mention that uh, I have been asked uh, uh, sort of the last moment uh, to fill in for two of my good friends who couldn't come. 
uh, Alan Meltzer and uh, Tommaso Pardos Chiopa, who also happen to be, you know, in the in this area. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I apologize in advance if uh, you know uh, I sort of am going maybe to jump a little bit uh, across subjects. Uh, <clears throat> uh, before starting, I would like to uh, uh, react to uh, two things that uh, Jose uh, said. First of all, I don't remember if I uh, uh, told Jose uh, sometime in the past, uh, you know, whatever he quoted me to say. Uh, but uh, I must admit that uh, it's not something that uh, is not characteristic of me. I might have said that, or something, uh, you know, something, something of this type. But also, I would like to say that, uh, in spite of following this advice of myself, let's say. I sometimes had got uh, some papers rejected. So it's not a foolproof formula for uh, getting uh, papers accepted. So this is, uh, uh, you know, one thing. Uh, the second thing, uh, on a more serious note, uh, concerns uh, your last statement, uh, Jose, and that is, uh, you know, the, the, the statement, I completely agree with you, that uh, uh, inflation targeting is an incomplete framework for monetary policy analysis because it disregards uh, uh, what uh, the central bank is going to do in special situations. And I should remind you that uh, in practically uh, all, if no, maybe most, but all, I, th I think it's all uh, central bank laws uh, it's not only price stability uh, that uh, is uh, an important objective, it's also financial stability. So by both uh, law and custom, even in those places in which it is not written, the central bank uh, you know, is the first actor in the uh, economy that uh, uh, you know, is expected to be in charge of financial stability. And uh, as Jose has mentioned, uh, there are times when uh, uh, there could be conflicts between uh, temporary conflicts, not long-run conflicts, but temporary conflicts between financial stability and between price stability. And uh, uh, now we hear a lot today about uh, transparency. This actually has become a code word of good conduct among central bankers, which may, make, makes me wonder, by the way, why this is not applied also to fiscal policy. But this well, is, yeah, is yeah, but this is just, yeah, right, exactly. This is echoing what Guido said, and, uh, you know, Guido gave some reasons why it is not, but probably more could be done. I mean, I'm talking now about on, on the normative side, but this is parenthetically. This is not the main issue of what I want to say uh, right now. Uh, the... Uh, 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 <coughs> Uh, the, the, the question is, if, if one wants to be transparent about the rule that the central bank is following, uh, then one must admit that there will be circumstances under which uh, the central bank uh, is going to deviate from the strict inflation target rule, if one takes uh, transparency uh, you know, seriously. And uh, then there is the thorny question of... Uh, formulating in advance what are going to be the contingencies, under what contingencies the central bank is going to deviate from the strict inflation target rule, and in what way will it, will it deviate? I would say that the problem is, is, a, is a, you know, if one wants to take transparency seriously, and this is actually the beginning of my argument about the limits of transparency, because what I want to uh, utilize my remaining 15 minutes is actually to, to say a few words about the limits of transparency. Because I think that, uh, you know, although there is a lot of enthusiasm about uh, transparency, it has its limits. And uh, I think the time has come to recognize that there are some serious limits to transparency and that the, both the feasible and the optimal level of transparency uh, as, by the way, I think is also suggested by some of the, you know, of the paper that Carl has uh, uh, presented, uh, they are not, uh, you know, 
they, they are internal. In other words, you know, the optimal level of transparency, but I would say even more that the feasible level of transparency is also internal. And uh, I don't have time to go to uh, what, you know, to all the, there are many arguments, I believe. I think quite interesting, uh, both theoretical and practical arguments. Uh, but I don't have the time to review uh, the, all those arguments with respect to the optimal level of transparency. Instead of that, I would like to utilize the, the time that I have in order to uh, actually analyze a little bit uh, the limits, the objective, or uh, practical limits to transparency, taking as given that uh, let's, let's say that indeed uh, it is optimal to have full transparency. I don't believe it is optimal to have full transparency. But suppose that for the sake of just uh, discovering what the limits are, suppose that we believe that full transparency is a good thing. I think there are serious limits to implementation of full transparency. And I would like to touch on three areas uh, in which uh, say current central banks are not transparent. And even those who are, uh, let's say, the most uh, the vocal advocates of transparency, like the Bank of England, are not transparent on those particular issues that I'm going to touch upon. And I, and I don't blame them for not being transparent. I think they are not transparent for good reason, because there are serious limitations on transparency with respect to uh, several kind of things. Now, uh, uh, this, by the way, I think uh, I should say before I continue that uh, uh, this goes uh, to some extent opposite to the views of my current neighbor at Princeton, Lars Svensson, who is a, a very strong uh, advocate of uh, transparency. And uh, he actually believes that uh, even, uh, yeah, you know, that one can even be transparent ex ante. I mean, you know, this is my, this is my reading of his beliefs, that one can even be transparent about uh, those contingencies that uh, Jose was talking about. That is, you know, when will uh, the central bank uh, deviate uh, from, uh, uh, you know, from a strict inflation targeting rule, let's say. <coughs> there is a big, and I, this uh, brings me back to the statement, to the thing that I opened up with, and that is that there is a serious difficulty, <coughs> there is a serious difficulty in uh, even sometimes uh, formulating what uh, those uh, uh, those uh, contingencies are. Hold on. <coughs> Hold on. <coughs> okay, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, <coughs> so. So the three areas that I would like to uh, use in order to illustrate that uh, even a bank like the Bank of England, that uh, is, uh, let's say, I would say probably today is a champion of transparency, are not transparent on, are the following. One is uh, what is the output gap that they use? You know, this nice uh, uh, objective function that we have seen floating around today several times has two components. It has, an out, it has an inflation gap, deviation of inflation from uh, the target. It also has an output gap. And best practice, you know, it's believed that the best practice uh, central banking today is that, uh, 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 you know, the central bank should minimize not only the deviation of inflation from the target, but also the deviation of uh, output from the target. And for central banks that are okay, that are respectable, you know, they should uh, minimize the, 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 the target should be potential output. But what is potential output? Of, uh, Atanasion of Fanides maybe could tell us, I think he has done most work, uh, you know, one of the people here uh, that has done the most work about potential output and about what policy makers believe about potential output. And actually his work has shown that the beliefs are changing like a yo-yo. I'm, so, I'm sorry for using an Israeli, you know, yo-yo, uh, how would you translate yo-yo uh, to English? You know? yo -yo. Is it the same word? Yo-yo. Yo -yo. yo -yo. <laughs> so, <clears throat> on top of that, 
we have uh, this uh, masterful book by Woodford that came out in 2003 and that tells us that potential output is, uh, uh, should be conceptually thought of as uh, uh, the level of output that would have been produced uh, in the economy under perfect competition uh, with fully flexible prices and wages. Now, uh, 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 and uh, I think this is uh, a very attractive uh, kind of concept from a conceptual point of view because it focuses uh, uh, the ideas uh, on the things that monetary policy can actually achieve. However, there is no perfect competition in the economy, you know, and even Woodford admits that, uh, you know, and utilizes models of monopolistic competition, so there's a first order distortion. So he assumes, together with uh, Rottenberg in 1997 and also in his book, that, uh, uh, that there are in place uh, subsidies and taxes uh, that offset this monopolistic competition distortion so that in the theory he, could, he can focus uh, only on the distortion that is due to staggering. But, are, but you know, we know there are subsidies and taxes, but are they directed at offsetting the monopolistic competition distortion? I don't think so. So what do you do if you're a central banker? Here is Stan, has to make policy. What, what is it going to take out of, uh, uh, out of uh, uh, Woodford, the wonderful book? So I don't know. I have no answer to that, but I just pose the question to you. So. I think there is a tremendous loss of transparency. You know, there is no, yeah, there is a lot of opaqueness about what the policy is going to, uh, about what the policy is and is going to be, if you don't define what the output gap is. But you cannot define the output gap without knowing what potential output is. So I, I you know, I put the question to you again: What is potential output? Now we know that central bankers and also the National Bureau of Economic Research and also the uh, you know, now there is a new task force that has been created in Europe uh, under the guide of the CEPR that, uh, you know, have de developing methods for, uh, uh, you know, for, for estimating potential output and the business cycle and so on. Now, all those methods are based uh, on, uh, uh, are based on uh, uh, you know, on some sort of smoothing of potential output. However, uh, uh, you know, th those methods uh, are not related at all uh, to the concept that Woodford advances in his book. So what does a practical central banker that has to decide about policy today do in such a situation? So, okay, I think I uh, don't want to utilize all my time on that point. The conclusion is that there is a lot of opaqueness about uh, uh, policy due to the fact that the economic profession has not made up its mind yet about what is potential output, point number one. Point number two uh, has to do with opaqueness uh, with respect to the lag structure, that, uh, 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 that uh, the lag structure between uh, uh, the choice of policy today and between the time that uh, uh, policy is going to affect the rate of inflation. And uh, again, I will take the Bank of England as an example, but this is something that is not only, this is shared by many central bankers. In the Bank of England, the statement that is being made is the following. You know, we, the choice of, of policy instrument today is going to affect the rate of inflation only in two years because of the lags. In the meantime, you know, we are free to, uh, you know, to basically utilize the uh, you know, in any case, it's not so. You know, you know we, we just have to take the rate of inflation uh, uh, for two years and on in our policy considerations because the lag is already sort of uh, predetermined, preordained. You know, now, I, 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 it seems to me that this is, uh, uh, on the other hand, if we believe the new Keynesians, uh, and we have seen a new Keynesian equation today, uh, for, we have seen uh, several of them, but let, let's take... Uh, you know, the, the, the one that Frank presented. And uh, so, you know, there is uh, expected inflation uh, is there as a very important term in the inflation equation. So 
uh, <clears throat> if the central bank uh, manages to change inflationary expectations today, it's going to affect the rate of inflation immediately. So what is the meaning of this statement on the part of the policymakers of the Bank of England? Are they saying that, uh, are they, uh, so the, the other, you know, I can think of two possibilities. One is that they don't believe in the, case, in the new Keynesian model, but uh, I would discard that because I think there are very sophisticated economists there and they know, I mean, they follow up on those things. I think the, the, I th I think the, the implicit statement, which again is not transparent, the implicit reason for that is that they actually gave up on trying to affect the, the rate of inflation by manipulating inflationary expectations. They don't want to manipulate inflationary expectations, but if, the, if this is the reason, they should have said so if they wanted to be transparent. Okay, so again, this is a point in which there is, you know, my, my point is not that it's bad, but that this is, a, is something that is not transparent. Finally, the last point uh, has to do, okay, <coughs> so, uh, so th those two points, uh, uh, we, you know, basically illustrate the two areas uh, in, uh, uh, two areas uh, in which uh, uh, the central bank uh, is not uh, uh, completely uh, or is far from being transparent uh, with respect to the economic structure that uh, it actually implicitly at least has in mind and that it uses in policy. Uh, <clears throat> there is a, uh, the central banks, central banks, even the, more, the, more, the, the most transparent ones, are also uh, not uh, transparent about their objective fun about parts of their objective functions. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, 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 I will identify uh, two pieces of the objective function for which there is really, I would say, a lot of opaqueness. And, this, you know, and this point has come up in the discussion this morning. One is this parameter, I think it's called lambda, in your paper, it's the relative weight that uh, the central bank uh, gives to stabilization of inflation, of the inflation gap versus the output gap. No central bank has ever made a statement about what lambda is. My neighbor, Lars Venson, says in his uh, 2003 uh, paper in the Journal of Economic Literature that he believes Time has come for central banks to actually announce what the lambda is. But this is not an easy task, particularly if policy is made up by a committee. Okay, you can think, you know, maybe the committee members, each one has a different lambda. So how are you going to be transparent about, uh, and we have heard a paper today about, uh, uh, you know, uh, decision making within a committee and so each one of them, you know, there is a chairman and there is a, the, the, the rest, you know, and I have one lambda, he has another lambda. It can also change with epsilon. I mean, you know, the, to tell, you know, to sort of uh, tell all this story to the people in the public, you know, to the woman that goes to the grocery store is really, uh, I think, a big job. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit hard to be transparent about those things. And let me echo what Vickers said, John Vickers, when he was, uh, a member of the policy committee of the Bank of England uh, said about this parameter, he called it alpha, not lambda, I don't know. He said, there is simply no way that this parameter can be put in the public domain. This is what he said when he was uh, on the monetary policy committee of the Bank of England. Finally, uh, work that uh, I've been involved in, and uh, also uh, Francisco Ujimochia has been involved in, uh, shows that uh, there are times and countries in which the, the central bank acts as if uh, it has uh, an asymmetric objective function. In particular, let me take the example of the United States. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, there is evidence, and maybe Francisco will want to add something about that, uh, and, I, and I'm referring now to a paper, JME 19, excuse me, JME 2003 uh, paper by Francisco, 
uh, that uh, allows uh, the loss function, the, the loss function part uh, of the uh, uh, of the output that is related to the output gap allows it to be asymmetric. In other words, uh, the, let me maybe draw a picture. Uh, Okay, so <clears throat> if this is potential output and this is actual output Y, <clears throat> so uh, as long as the central bank, as long as potential, as output is above, uh, is above potential, uh, you know, on, when, when output is below potential, we have the usual quadratic. Uh, you know, losses increase like in the usual quadratic. But however, uh, uh, when output is above potential output, then losses increase, but they increase, uh, you know, at a smaller rate. It could be even flat. As a matter of fact, I never understood why policymakers, you know, would be worried about uh, uh, a level of output that is above potential, given inflation. We you know they could be worried about that because of the because of the effect of inflation. But given inflation, if the output is larger than potential, why should they worry about that? seems to me that it should be flat. In any case, Francisco actually estimated, allowed, you know, uh, 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 estimated a, a loss function, well, uh, worked out the implications of a loss function of this type for the reaction function of the central bank, uh, 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 you know, and applied it to US data uh, and found out uh, that uh, there is evidence for the United States uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, that there is such a symmetry with respect to uh, with respect to the output gap, or with respect to the deviation of the rate of unemployment from the natural rate of unemployment, and this is echoed, by the way, in a statement by Ellen Blinder uh, after he stepped down as being uh, vice chairman of the Fed, in which he said that uh, whenever the Fed uh, acts preemptively uh, against uh, inflation and misses gets much more political flack. Uh, one, one and a half minute. Gets, okay, I am aware of that. Uh, it gets much more political flack than uh, when it uh, strikes preemptively against unemployment and misses. Okay? And actually, there is the Full Employment Act of 1946 uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, 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 basically uh, states that the Fed is equally responsible for uh, economic activity as it, is, uh, as it is for inflation, and they have their memories of the Great Depression and so on. In any case, my time is up. What is the, what is the implication of that for transparency? All the work that I have seen uh, 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 really looks at, uh, at uh, 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 assumes basically uh, at uh, quadratic utility functions. Uh, and basically, lately, I hear from people like indirectly uh, that are either close or related to Ben Bernanke, who is going to be the new chairman and so on, that actually policy should be symmetric. It should be symmetric, okay? This is normative statement. It should be symmetric. However, it has not been symmetric in the past. Here is the evidence. And you can tell us maybe something about this evidence. Is that transparent? I'm done. Well, it's a, a great pleasure to uh, be here at this uh, conference honoring uh, Alex, and I think it's a mark of the contributions he's made that, at least from the viewpoint of uh, a central banker, almost every paper uh, in this conference is almost immediately relevant to a variety of issues that uh, we confront on a daily basis. And uh, if there's one, th one thing that uh, marks Alex's work, it is the fact that uh, at least since uh, since the 90s, it's all been very, very close. Uh, it's theoretical 
but it's also very close uh, to practice and has, in fact, had a, a significant influence on uh, monetary policy around the world. Uh, what I would like to do is to take up uh, six topics briefly, uh, just to touch on them in the sense that since this is a conference honoring an academic with an interest in uh, policy and an influence on policy, I'd like to throw up some uh, questions and some reflections. I think every one of the issues I'm going to raise is unsolved. And uh, so I just want to uh, reflect on them a little bit. I think the uh, financial stability issue, which is in the title for this session, uh, is getting increasingly complicated by virtue of the fact that financial supervision uh, is moving out of central banks or has moved out of central banks in a lot of countries. And the uh, fundamental determinant of whether you're going to have a financial crisis is the uh, strength of the financial system. Uh, and that's the responsibility of someone else than uh, the central bank. If you uh, ask what contributions the central bank can make to financial stability uh, through its policies. Obviously, maintenance of macroeconomic stability is the primary one. Uh, the other one is to be very, uh, very effective as a lender of last resort. And uh, one thinks that doesn't happen in well-regulated economies. Well, it happened uh, very early in Alan Greenspan's term in 1987 when the U.S. stock market fell 25 percent uh, in one day. And uh, the Fed reacted appropriately uh, by telling the markets they'd flood the markets with liquidity. Uh, and uh, the recovery was very, uh, very quick although there are people around who will say that they didn't remove the accommodation quickly enough uh, and that contributed to the inflation uh, that, that uh, took place in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, the other contribution uh, central banks uh, can make on the uh, strength of financial system is through uh, analysis. Uh, of what's going on in the systems. That's what the financial stability reports are about. Uh, they're much more there because the banks don't have the responsibility, the central banks no longer have the responsibility for uh, supervising the system. Uh, if they're going to be responsible for financial stability, they've got to have some capacity uh, to understand what's going on and to increase their understanding. That's why I think we have uh, these financial stability reports being written. I actually think that the financial stability emphasis is a mistake, that uh, it forces you to emphasize crises, and that it is no less important how well the financial system works most of the time uh, as that we should avoid having crises and we should of course, avoid having crises, uh, but uh, I, I would like uh, to think that those should really be financial sector reports rather than financial stability reports, and uh, they should be focused on stability, crises, uh, but also uh, efficiency. Uh, second, uh, second issue, uh, asset price uh, bubbles, which have not which is an issue that has not uh, been resolved in the, uh, in the literature. Uh, and it's related to uh, financial stability. Uh, every now and then, uh, financial sectors get captured by, uh, by irrational exuberance, by animal spirits, whatever. And uh, price earnings ratios go to unprecedented heights asset prices go to values which are very hard to understand. These things have been around forever. Uh, as we know, there's this great book which you could really enjoy reading, written in 1844, uh, called Popular Delusions in the Madness of Crowds, which describes the major financial uh, bubbles up to that time. 
there are some people who claim that the uh, fact that for the price of a tulip bulb you could uh, buy a, a golden carriage and four horses to carry it in Amsterdam uh, doesn't prove anything about whether the price of tulip bulbs was uh, out of line, but I must say I find that particular story uh, hard, uh, hard to believe. And these things uh, happen. And then what are you supposed to do? Well, there's circumstance in which it's very easy. Uh, if, uh, if you think that those asset prices are going to influence inflation or that you're going to have high inflation, then it's very simple. Uh, you deal with them. Uh, the deputy governor of the Central Bank of Japan on, the, uh, on a previous occasion when this was discussed at an international conference said, uh, what did you expect us to do during the asset price bubble, the land price bubble in Japan in the late 80s when uh, it, I think one of the facts was that the amount of land on which the Imperial Palace was built in, uh, in Tokyo which is a couple of uh, acres, was worth more than all the land in California. He said, what did you want us to do? Interest inflation was zero. We had no excuse for raising interest rates. Uh, so how were we supposed to deal with these uh, land price, uh, with this land price bubble? I simply don't, I think we simply don't uh, have a very good answer to this. Part of the answer lies in regulation uh, and uh, if it's housing prices that are uh, bubbling then you can change the uh, terms of financing of mortgage financing in terms of minimum down payments and so forth. The Fed has tended to argue that those regulations are ineffective but I never quite understood why they didn't try to use them uh, as opposed to just saying they were ineffective. Nobody ever said they were perverse. Uh, and it always seemed to me to be uh, worth, uh, worth a try. Uh, similarly, with, uh, in the stock market with margin requirements, where there is a bit more evidence that they're not very effective, my guess is you have some effect there. The uh, current deputy uh, president or vice president or whatever of the European Central Bank, uh, Lucas Papadamus, who shares... Uh, a common uh, PhD with uh, three members of this panel, uh, says that he talked down an asset price bubble when he was governor of the Bank of uh, Greece, uh, that he went on TV, said the prices were outrageous, they declined by 25%, and nobody tried to beat him up. Well, uh, that uh, whole combination seems to me implausible, but uh, open, open, mouth, open mouth policy uh, may work. It did not work in the case of Alan Greenspan uh, in uh, 1996 when his uh, complaints about asset prices uh, had an effect for just a few days. I think that's just another unsolved uh, problem for monetary policy uh, as to how to deal with uh, these particular problems. Third issue I'd like to discuss is that of the horizon of uh, monetary policy and flexible inflation targeting. And this is an issue that uh, Alex just discussed with regard to the UK. I don't think that uh, the uh, UK is, uh, is uh, concealing something when it says it's, its target is to have inflation in two years uh, back at the uh, target level of now 2%. I think that's what they mean and I think there's a lot of work which says, or used to say, that uh, it does take about that long for monetary policy to have its uh, impact. Um, that's a very different problem in Israel, where monetary policy, for good or ill, has a very immediate impact on inflation through the exchange rate. I think it actually is a complication uh, for uh, for policy that uh, you get a very quick pass through to inflation but that it comes through a particular channel which is one that you may not want to use uh, now that we're in a position where the exchange rate is very depreciated relative to uh, its average and when I say that I mean the basket exchange rate not the uh, dollar exchange rate 
Because uh, we trade extensively with Europe, the relevant exchange rate from the viewpoint of the balance of payments is not the dollar rate, which hasn't changed very much, but the uh, rate against the currency basket, and that over the past uh, four or five years has depreciated very significantly because the euro appreciated. Um, the fact that we can influence inflation fairly quickly by changing the exchange rate uh, isn't a problem when the currency is, uh, is not uh, appreciated. But if you're dealing, uh, if you're in a situation where you have a balance of payments problem and uh, you're in a large deficit, this is again something that Jose said, uh, then you have the problem that if you're going to deal with inflation through raising the interest rate, you can get uh, an immediate impact by appreciating the exchange rate. But that has adverse impacts on, uh, on another variable that's of interest, uh, which is the, uh, the balance of payments. So I think the, uh, the uh, fact that we have that uh, impact uh, in Israel, which would enable us to actually control inflation with a much shorter uh, horizon than the British two years, uh, is problematic and that for reasons of not destabilizing output excessively we should try to avoid using that channel too much uh, and uh, not try to come back quickly if we're well outside the band or even close to being outside the band uh, to within, uh, within the band and that's the whole notion of uh, flexible inflation targeting which says that you do not aim to be inside the band all the time if you've been forced out of it, either because you made a mistake or because there's some unexpected event, but that you aim to come back uh, gradually. The British aim to come back in two years. My sense is that in Israel, uh, one can aim to come back somewhat more quickly, but that uh, it should not be aiming to get back within the uh, band uh, very quickly. Topic four, transparency. I, uh, by the way, we're obviously all talking about the same thing, so uh, I apologize for the overlap. And the question is, can there be too much of it? I, didn't, I don't think of the problems that Alex raised as all being about being non-transparent. I think there are areas where there's just a lack of understanding in some cases. Uh, of what's uh, really going on. I don't think people know what their lambdas uh, are, and uh, I don't think it's a lack of transparency. I think it's a, uh, a lack of knowledge. Similarly, what the output gap is, which is very hard to uh, measure, so I don't think they're concealing anything. I, I don't suspect that the Bank of England would claim that there's actually an output gap which they are trying to uh, to uh, bring to zero and that they know what it is but they're not telling you. They just don't know. And you have to deal with the fact that we don't know that. I think in the end uh, you go back to the unemployment rate uh, more than to uh, the output gap uh, in a country where unemployment is, uh, is station, more stationary as in the United States, it's easier to use the, out, the unemployment rate. But even in Israel, where there have clearly been secular changes in the unemployment rate, I think we're looking as much at the unemployment rate, if not more, uh, as at the uh, output gap. I think there are other issues of transparency which are equally complicated and uh, equally interesting, which is what is it that you publish about your deliberations and what forecasts do you publish. About your deliberations there is the question of whether when you write the uh, minutes of the uh, uh, or when you publish the uh, report or the protocol as it's called in, in Hebrew uh, of the meeting, uh, how much do you reveal about individual positions? Uh, should you make it clear what everybody said? If you make it clear what everybody said, you help create the uh, you help create people talking for the record and for the newspapers, uh, and I think you inhibit the discussion. 
Bank of England does identify what, who said what, and some of them now regret uh, having got into that, uh, into that uh, position. That's an issue of whether you can go too far on uh, transparency. Then there's the question of the forecasts. What do you put in them? Expected inflation, obviously. Uh, interest rates, exchange rates, and if so, which ones? Do you put in the ones that your model expects? Do you put in the ones uh, the market expects? Uh, my colleague Akiva said, don't put in anything that's inconsistent. Um, that, if you say that, then you're going to the models. Uh, and uh, you're going to have to do that. Then you might reveal uh, that then you might, period after period, show great inaccuracies uh, in the assumptions. Well, maybe you should just do that. But I think there's an issue there, which was came up very nicely uh, in a paper by uh, Carl Walsh, uh, which is directly relevant to what you, be say what you should be saying. So I don't know the answer to these ones. Uh, as I mentioned in a lecture a week ago, fortunately, so far, what the markets have believed about future interest rates and exchange rates been pretty close to what we believed uh, in the Bank of Israel. So we might as well have used the market uh, forecasts as, uh, as our own forecasts or what our models uh, told us. I'd like to uh, end with uh, something which is close to transparency and uh, relates to the paper by Athanasius uh, Orphanides. Um, I'm sort of struck by the fact that every time I look at a fan chart of the Bank of England or the Bank of Israel or anybody else, nobody's been in those extremes. Banks have succeeded in staying much closer to the center of the band for long periods than those fan charts say. And I would guess, though I don't know who's done the exercise, that the ex post distribution of, uh, of inflation rates is actually much more concentrated than what the uh, fan charts uh, show. And the question is, is why? Uh, the models include optimizing behavior of some sort by the central bank. So it can't just be that the central bank, uh, that the models forgot that the central bank will try to get back into the band. That's supposed to be in the model. So there's something else uh, going on. And I've, I don't have an answer, but I've sort of been impressed by the fact that I don't think we use the models in quite the way that we think. I think there's another decision process going on, which is very close to the one described in Athanasio's paper, which is basically uh, that when you think inflation's rising, you raise interest rates. Uh, and you're not quite sure of the trajectory you're going to get, uh, but you know you're operating in the right direction. It's some sort of feedback rule. And that this thing works much better than uh, the models uh, tell you uh, it would. So I don't know if there's some inaccuracy in the model. Uh, Athanasius' results come out of the model, so it can't be a model... Uh, driven thing. I think, uh, I think there's more robustness uh, in what happens, because every bank, raise, every central bank raises, the, does more or less the same thing, raises interest rates by the 25 basis points. And incidentally, there's a reason uh, to do that, which I'll abuse my privilege as stuff. I'll tell you why we changed to 25 basis points in the Bank of Israel. Because I think if you use little amounts, you escape, you avoid making decisions. If you say, okay, this time we'll do 10 basis points, then you have a nice compromise. Some guys want 25, some want zero. Okay, 10. Uh, so that's why we ruled it out. We either make the decision that we're going to raise rates or we don't. Uh, and uh, that was that. Now, that, that minute was on your account, uh, Asaf. So let me, uh, let me get to uh, the final point. Uh, I uh, was struck, I read, I had reason to read recently the, uh, the article by uh, Lucas and Sargent in 1978 after Keynesian macroeconomics in which they said something about the role of expectations is pervasive 
And once we analyze them properly, the dynamic properties of the economy will change drastically. That's roughly uh, what they said. Um, we've now got ourselves into a situation where almost every inflation-targeting central bank basically has got a lot of credibility and long-term expectations are well anchored around the inflation target. I suspect that what's going on is that the models, uh, that there's much, the, the, the uh, feedback effects within the models from changes in interest rates uh, in the world are stronger than those we've yet identified in the models. And uh, I'll end by quoting, uh, quoting something I heard in a seminar at Chicago from Milton Friedman uh, very long ago when uh, I, I did some work on uh, feedback rules in 1969 or 70. And somebody, before the Lucas critique, somebody in the audience raised the question, but won't the structure of the model change if you uh, use these rules? And Friedman, whose intuition is better than uh, anybody else's analysis, said, oh, I think the structure of the model will change in a way that's supportive of the impact that your rule has within the existing structure i.e. there will be a multiplier effect from changes in the structure. I've never seen anybody work that out. But it is extraordinary that the stabilizing effects of monetary policy in the last 15 years, uh, inflation-oriented monetary policy, inflation-targeting monetary policy, has been much more successful than our models say uh, it should be. So the end of the first round, let me make just one comment on one of the six points that uh, Stan made about the nastiness of the exchange rate problem. I recently attended a uh, Dallas Fed conference about globalization and inflation, and then uh, Charles Engel and Mick Devereux have a paper, and they argue, convincingly I guess, that the exchange rate has two tasks. First task is to equi equilibrate the goods market, so to avoid the big card account imbalances and the like. And the second task is to equilibrate the capital market that is driven by expectations of future developments of the economy. This argument led them to think that a monetary rule should be based not only on the output gap and the inflation, but somewhat on the exchange rate. And if you remember Milton Friedman, 10 or 20 years before Stan uh, had him in a seminar, Friedman ignored completely international capital movements in his theoretical model or in the conceptual model and became an advocate of flexible exchange rate. At the same time, Bob Mandel ignored completely the uh, first task of the exchange rate and became obsessed to his uh, fixed exchange rate. And Mick Devereux and Charles Engel actually argued, at least conceptually, that the Taylor rule should have also an argument, the exchange rate. So it's basically some sort of a mix between managed exchange rate and a perfect float. Now, we have uh, five minutes for very quick comments from the audience. 
And then we update our strategy and the three distinguished members of the panel, each one will respond in three minutes. So go ahead. Why don't you, for the sake of the guests, present your name and affiliation? Uh, my name is Akiva Altenbacher, I'm the monetary department of the Bank of Israel. Uh, I'd like to ask Alex to do me a favor and ask his neighbor Lars Svensson the following a question. <laughs> Assume that, or if you prefer to uh, say what you think Lars Svensson is now. Uh, I think we will call it okay. Uh, Lambda is not verified. Okay. Therefore, I, I, I have the opinion that the public will believe <laughs> that any announced lambda is less than the true lambda. I okay. we'll always believe there's a little bit extra. There's a huge, a little bit extra. That, that so quick, that, quick. So that, uh, so that and then there's an incentive for the central bank to announce a lambda that's less than the true lambda under the assumption that there's some equilibrium mu. You don't know what In other words, it's always going to remove the uncertainty to something else. I would even. Now, in that situation, it doesn't really pay to announce the lambda. Next. So, we are now in the second round. We'll start with uh, Jose, going to Alex, and then to Stan. Each one, three, four minutes. Yeah, I, I, I will make some, some comments on yeah, basically on the on the discussion. There is a, uh, this issue about transparency. Transparency has two objectives. One is to is for accountability because a democracy delegates power on an important institution, the central bank. So you have to be transparent to be accountable. But those I think that they are fulfilled with central banks very transparent. And the second role is to make more effective monetary policy. So the limit to, to transparency is, is, is the, is the, is the effect, effectiveness of monetary policy. And this is, for example, when Stan said, you cannot, in China, we do not write the opinion of, with the name. We said, well, members of the board said something in the, in the minutes. We don't identify names because we don't want, we, talking for the record or for the public or doing so so to make it more more effective so i think that that's that sort of the of the of the limits for a, a transparency now there is one thing that i i, I have read and it's very important transparency and in, increasing transparency is irreversible so we have to be also very careful about whether we keep new steps in terms of transparency, because then you cannot say, well, I made a mistake. Instead of publishing minutes, I won't have minutes. So, so it's, it's, it's a very important decision. Then regarding there was a, a comment about the, and Alex said about the policy should be symmetric, but it's not symmetric. And, and I have been always have, not respect to the output gap, but, but respect to inflation. And this is how, how you feel. When, when inflation is below the target, we have a band or whatever, but it's below the target. Central bankers, I have to confess, are not so worried that when inflation is, 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 is above the target. But that can be, you can rationalize that with a non-linear Phillips curve or with some different mechanisms as inflation goes up, picks up, and when inflation goes down. So there is no rationality or, or, or exchange preferences that will lead you to that. And Finally, I, I think that the, the, the lambda issue is extremely tough one because I don't know my lambda. And, and I came to the Holy Land to look for my lambda. I hope to find it, but, but I, am very, I am very skeptical. Thank you. you know, lambda in Hebrew means to learn. So you, you got it. Before we move on, I see Itamar Abinovich, who is our president, and he would like to say a few words. So could you? Come over, please. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Governor, Alex, colleagues, uh, dear friends. Uh, I apologize for this appearance as a diabolus ex, uh, ex machina, but uh, uh, there are three or four different events on campus this, uh, this evening, and I'm trying to, to juggle. Uh, but I did not want to, for this day to be over without coming to, to greet Alex and thank him on on behalf of the university. 
As you know and as you embody in your very presence here, the School of Economics at Tel Aviv University is an outstanding unit and certainly a pride and a jewel of uh, Tel Aviv University. And the, uh, that is an achievement of, of a group of individuals who put the school together and kept it going and, and built it to, to its present uh, standing. And uh, Alex is a, is a member of that, uh, of that group. So uh, he and his colleagues have been able to to build both a collective identity and yet to, uh, to keep an individual identity and a profile for, for each of them, and another remarkable uh, achievement. Um, Alex, uh, this is not retirement. This is retirement from teaching. Uh, as you know, our culture is that uh, uh, faculty members who retire don't have to teach anymore, but they are welcome to encourage to, to stay, keep an office, uh, research, uh, uh, supervised doctoral students, and if uh, any of them volunteers to teach, we, we never object. But this, this, is, this is not propositioning. This is a, a description of, uh, of reality. But the, the point is really that uh, in this uh, day and age, age in, in both senses of the term, uh, it's no time to retire, but the privilege that you don't have to, to do formal teaching uh, anymore, and we regard you as an ongoing full member of the university community. And yet, it is a point of uh, transition, a point of reflection, and a point in which uh, we want to thank you uh, for many years of uh, outstanding service to, to the university. Uh, you were not just a, a, a very important uh, economist and professor of economics, but also a, a full member of the university community. Uh, I've always been surprised by your expertise in diverse areas when we discussed the formation of a school of government in the university, it turned out that the one person who knew about ENA in this uh, campus was Alex. I'm not surprised, but one of many indications of, uh, of your familiarity with uh, uh, diverse uh, topics and, and your contribution to Tel Aviv University in so many fields. So once again, thank you, and uh, a lot of good luck, comparable success in the next phase of, of your career. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ita. And the last two distinguished speakers are first Alex and then Ben. Do, do you need the uh, microphone? Three minutes. Okay. Uh, I, uh, uh, first, uh, to Akiva's question, our last slide. I don't know if you will have a very uh, clear answer to that because, uh, you know, uh, but uh, I agree that, uh, you know, that probably the central bank has uh, an, you know, an, infl say an inflation target or central bank, uh, not only inflation targeters, but the central bank always, for obvious reasons, has uh, an incentive to appear tougher on inflation than it actually is. So that was so, you know, so. And, but I think it's justified. In other words, uh, you know, because uh, if the public believes that uh, the central bank is actually tougher, then uh, it's not that, uh, you know, it's not that uh, the central bank is trying to conceal things or something like that, but, uh, you know, so this is not, you know, Stan uh, uh, sort of uh, attributed to me that. Uh, you know, I think that I'm accusing central bankers, you know, like the Bank of England, to conceal things or something like that. No, I don't think that is the, you know, I don't think the Bank of England is trying to, uh, you know, to, to hide anything. I think what I, I think the statement is that, uh, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I, I sort of jumped to, to uh, you know, to another issue, uh, but I will already complete it. Uh, 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 the... Uh, 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 with respect to, uh, I, th I think to the extent that there is lack of transparency at the Bank of England, it's not because they are deliberately trying to, uh, you know, to, to uh, hide something. I think it is because of the uh, state of economic science. I think, you know, it is a reflection of uh, uh, our uh, limited amount of knowledge. But to say, in view of this limited amount of knowledge, that uh, the central bank is very transparent, I think, is a, a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of uh, the, uh, sort of taking the you know the models that we are playing with 
to seriously. The, the, this is all the statement, you know, that I wanted to, to make. Now, I would like, you know, with respect to uh, uh, the rest, you know, the question we'd like to ask, you know, I'll pose it, but I don't think you will get, uh, I don't think he thinks a lot about those issues. He thinks about, uh, you know, other issues. The other comment that I wanted to make uh, is uh, uh, with respect to uh, what you said, Stan, about Friedman 20 years ago, you know, that he had the intuition that... Uh, 34 years ago. 34 years ago, you know. Okay, never mind. I will not I will argue about the years. <laughs> Many years ago. <laughs> Many years ago, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that to the extent that the structure changes, it's going to reinforce, uh, you know, uh, 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 his argument. I can see one mechanism in which it is fairly clear that uh, this happens. Think about the uh, stabilization of inflation. Okay, think about the Israeli stabilization, the stabilization that took place in Chile, in many countries in South America, and so on. We know that there is a lot of evidence, and actually it came out in some of the papers today. As a matter of fact, in, I think in the evidence that you showed, uh, Jose, at the beginning, that there has been a tremendous change in the transmission mechanism, in particular the, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, pass-through coefficient from oil prices has decreased uh, quite, you know, has decreased quite substantially. In Israel, for example, there is evidence that uh, uh, the pass-through coefficient from the exchange rate to prices has decreased, uh, you know, a few years after stabilization and so on. What does that mean? It means that uh, basically, uh, the, what is the policy implication? The policy implication is that the central bank has more freedom, uh, you know, after the, this structure changes, more freedom to engage in stabilization of output. And I would submit this is the main reason, in my view, for keeping, for, you know, for, for putting the central bank to be in charge of, a, a, you know, a, a, dog, a watchdog on inflation. Because if, uh, you know, if, uh, if inflation is led to, you know, is led to run out, then uh, your expectations, you know, your expectations are disanchored then you may have to go again through a period of stabilization and, you know, the whole structure is going to change in an adverse manner. And uh, uh, this way, uh, you know, you actually, uh, uh, you actually uh, safeguard the benefits of the previous stabilization and you are able to engage more in stabilization of output uh, than uh, during the high inflation uh, And the last word from Stan. Just a, a few brief comments, uh, uh, mainly on what uh, Jose said. You know, the, uh, one of the factors that was different in the Asian crises than the uh, other crises, and part of the reasons they were so expensive, was that they have much bigger financial systems in Asia because they save much more. And uh, the financial sector in, say, in, uh, in, say Thailand was like value of financial assets was 250 percent of GDP. Brazil had a crisis uh, two years later, its financial assets were 60 percent of GDP. Uh, the, uh, having a financial collapse in one place is a heck of a lot more expensive uh, than it is, uh, it is in the other. Um, incidentally, calculating output costs are very, very difficult. I mean, we try to do it, I've tried to do it, uh, but the question is, you, you, for this is another example of the difficulty of measuring potential output. They were almost certainly in an unsustainable situation before, so before the crisis. So if you start measuring from the peak level of output and project the growth rate from there, you're adding a lot to, to the output costs. But the costs were enormous because you can calculate the fiscal costs pretty exactly. And in the Indonesian place, they were close to 50% of GDP. That's quite a lot to add to uh, your national debt at, uh, at one shot. So the costs were enormous. Uh, on the question of procyclicality of lending, there's another nice issue. Somebody, oh, Athanasio said, what can you work on? Uh, what, what do we practitioners have to suggest for you to work on? The procyclicality of lending, you can solve that by, by having procyclical capital requirements for the banking system. Uh, it's an interesting question why nobody will do that. You certainly, it's a very, it's a tax, it's a tax 
on the banking system. It's a stabilization tax. Uh, I've never figured out, it doesn't come naturally to anybody to think that you should do that, but I think you might be able uh, to do that. I would guess the reason you don't do it is if you did it to the banks, you'd find the lending moving off somewhere else and uh, you wouldn't in fact control credit uh, that way. Finally, on the asymmetry of the inflation target, I just think that's a mistake. And I think the, uh, the argument that uh, it's better to be under is actually the other way around because the nonlinearity of the Phillips curve is worse at the lower inflation rates than at the higher. But uh, we can discuss that next time. Thanks. So time to finish. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, from left to right uh, Alex, Stan and Jose and the audience. And as uh, Ed Morrow used to say, good night and good luck. <laughs> But, but then it's that way. Uh,